first of all, let me apologize to you because I was not able to hear, although I got to read some of your testimony yesterday. Uh, we have a schedule that says we must finish health care within a certain time. Whether we get it right or wrong, we've got to get it done in a certain time. And so I was involved with that, and I apologize. <clears throat> Number two is I apologize to you for the outbursts that have occurred in this committee. Anybody who values life like I do and is pro-life recognizes that the way you change minds is not yell at people as you love them and you care about their concerns <clears throat> and you create them to a level of understanding, not condemnation. And so for that, I apologize. I admire your composure and I thank the chairman and the ranking member for the way they handled that as well. I want <clears throat> to spend a few moments with you, but I, I kind of want to change the tone here a little bit in terms of what we talk about. A lot of Americans are watching this hearing, and when I get together with a couple of doctors, they don't understand half of what I say. And when two lawyers talk, most of us who aren't lawyers, like I'm not, uh, have trouble following. So I, I, I want us to use words that the American people can truly understand as I both ask you questions and as you answer them. I, I will try to do that, and I hope that you will as well, because I think it benefits our country to do that. <clears throat> You've been asked a lot of questions about abortion, and you've said that Roe v. Wade is settled law. Where are we today? What is the settled law in America about abortion? I can speak to what the court has said in its precedent. Um, in Planned Parenthood versus um, Casey, the court reaffirmed the core holding of Roe versus Wade, that a woman has a constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy in certain circumstances. In Casey, the court announced that in reviewing state regulations that um, may apply to that right, that the court considers whether that regulation has an undue burden on the woman's constitutional right. That is my understanding of what the so, state well, of the so law is. Let, let, me, let me give you a couple of cases. Let's say <clears throat> I'm 38 weeks pregnant and we discover a small spina bifida sac on the lower sacrum, the lower part of the back on my baby, <clears throat> and I feel like I just can't handle a child with that. Would it be legal in this country to terminate that child's life? I can't answer that question in the abstract because I would have to look at what the state of the state's law was on that question and, wh and what the state said with respect to that issue. Um, I can say that the, the question of the number of weeks that um, a woman is pregnant has been, that approach to looking at a woman's act has, was changed by Casey. The question is, is the state regulation regulating what a woman does an undue burden. And so I can't answer your <coughs> hypothetical because I can't look at it as an abstract without knowing what state laws exist on this issue or not. And even if I knew that, I probably couldn't apply because I'm sure that situation might well arise before the court. Okay. <coughs> well, <coughs> does technology in terms of the advancement of technology, should it have any bearing whatsoever on the way we look at Roe v. Wade? For example, published reports most recently of a 21 week, 21 week, that's 142 days, uh, fetus alive and well now at nine months of age with no apparent complications because the technology has advanced so far <clears throat> that we can now save children who are born prematurely at that level. Should that have any bearing as we look at the law? The law has answered a different question. It's talked about the constitutional right of women uh, in certain it. circumstances. And as I indicated, the issue becomes one of what's the state regulation in any particular circumstance. I understand. Circumstance. But, but sh all I'm asking is, should it have any bearing? I can't answer that in the abstract because the question, <clears throat> as it would come before me, wouldn't be in and in the way that you form it as as a um, as a citizen it would come to me as a judge in the context of some action that someone's taking whether if it's the state the state if it's a um, private citizen being controlled by the state challenging that action 
those issues are, are, but, are but viability is a portion of a lot of that <clears throat> and, and a lot of the decisions have been made basis on viability if we now have viability at 21 weeks why would that not be something that should be considered a, as we look at the status of what can and cannot happen in terms of this right to privacy that's been granted under Roe v. Wade and Casey? All I can say <clears throat> to you is what the court's done and All the right. standard that the court has applied, what factors it may or may not look at within a particular factual situation can't be predicted in a way to say, Yes, absolutely, that's going to be considered. No, this won't be considered. All I'm asking is whether it should. Uh, should, should viability, should technology at any time be considered as we discuss these very uh, delicate issues that have such an impact on so many people? And your, your answer is that you can't answer it. I can't because that's not a question that the court reaches out to answer. Well, That's a <clears throat> question that gets created by a state regulation of some sort or, or an action by the state that may or may not, according to some claimant, place an undue burden on her. We don't make policy choices in the court. We look at the case before us with the interests that are argued by the parties, look at our precedent, and try to apply its principles to the arguments parties are raising. I'm reminded of one of your quotes that says you do make policy, and I won't continue that. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm concerned, and, uh, <clears throat> and I think many others are, does a state legislature have the right under the Constitution to determine what is death? Have we statutorily defined in and we have in 50 states and most of the territories, what is the definition of death? You, th you think that's within the realm of the Constitution that states can do that? Depends on what they're applying that definition to. And so there are situations in which they might and situations where that definition would or would not have applicability to the dispute before the court. Um, all state action is looked at within the context of what the state is attempting to do and what liabilities it's imposing. But you would not deny the fact that the states do have the right to set up <coughs> statutes that define, uh, to give guidance to their citizen what constitutes death. As I said, it depends on in what context they're attempting to do that. They're doing it so they limit the liability of others with regard to that decision, which would inherently be the right of a state legislature as I read the Constitution. You may have a different response to that. And, and which brings me back <coughs> to technology again. Um, as recently as uh, six months ago, we now record fetal heartbeats at 14 days post-conception. Uh, we record fetal brain waves at 39 days post-conception. And I don't expect you to answer this, but I do expect you to pay attention to it as you contemplate these big issues, is we have this schizophrenic uh, rule of the law where we have defined death as the absence of those, but we refuse to define life as the presence of those. And uh, all of us are dependent at different levels on other people uh, during all stages of our development from the very early in the womb, outside of the womb, to the very late. Uh, and it concerns me uh, that we are so inaccurate, or inaccurate is an improper term, inconsistent in terms of our application of the logic. You said that Roe v. Wade is settled law yesterday. And, uh, and, and I believe it's settled under the basis of the right to privacy, uh, uh, which has been there. So the, the question I'd like to turn to uh, next is, <clears throat> In your ruling, uh, the Second Circuit ruling on, uh, and I'm trying to remember the name of the case, Maloney, uh, the position was is that there's not an individual uh, fundamental right to bear arms in this country. Is that, is that a correct understanding of that? No, sir. Okay. And please educate me if you would. In the Supreme Court's decision in Heller, it recognized an individual rights to bear arms as a right 
guaranteed by the Second Amendment, an important right, and one that limited the actions a federal, the federal government could take with respect to the possession of firearms. And in that case, we're talking about handguns. The Maloney case presented a different question, and that was whether that individual right would limit the activities that states could do to regulate the possession of firearms. That question is addressed by a legal doctrine. That legal doctrine uses the word fundamental, but it doesn't have the same meaning that <coughs> common people understand that word to mean. To most people, the word by its dictionary term is um, critically important, central, uh, fundamental. It's sort of rock basis. Those meanings are not how the law uses that term when it comes to what the states can do or not do. The term has a very specific legal meaning, which, which means, is that amendment of the Constitution incorporated against the states? Through the 14th and, Amendment. Through, <coughs> and others, but the quite generally, I shouldn't say and others, through the 14th. Uh, the question becomes whether and how that amendment to the Constitution that um, that protection applies or limits the states to act. In Maloney, the issue for, uh, with, for us was a very narrow one. We recognize that uh, Heller held, and it is the law of the land right now in the sense of precedent, that there is an individual right to bear arms. Um, as it applies to government, federal government regulation, the question in Maloney was different for us. Okay. Was that right incorporated against <clears throat> the states? And we determined that given Supreme Court precedent, precedent that had addressed that precise question and said it's not, so it wasn't fundamental in that legal doctrine sense, that was the court's <clears throat> holding. Did the Supreme Court say in Heller that it definitely was not, or did they just fail to rule on it? Well, they failed to rule on it. Okay, You're that, right. But, there's a, but there's I, a very big difference there. I agree. Okay. Let, let me continue with that. So uh, I sit in Oklahoma in my home, and what we have today as law on the land, as you see it, is I do not have a fundamental incorporated right to bear arms, as you see the law today. <clears throat> It's not how I see the law. Well, as it, you see the interpretation of the law today, in your opinion of what the law is today, is, is my statement a correct statement? No, it's not my interpretation. I was applying both Supreme Court precedent deciding that question and Second Circuit precedent that had directly answered that question and so, said it's not incorporated. The issue of whether or not there, it should be is a different question, and that is the question that the Supreme Court may take up. In fact, in his, um, in his opinion, Justice Scalia suggested it should, but it's not has said about it. So what does the law say today about the statement? What, where do we stand today about my statement that I have, <clears throat> I claim to have a fundamental guaranteed, spelled out right under the Constitution that is individual and applies to me the right to own and bear a barrel arm. Am I right or am I wrong? I can't answer the question of incorporation other than to uh, refer to precedent. Okay. Precedent says, as, as the Second Circuit interpreted the Supreme Court's precedent, you. that it's not, a, in, it's not incorporated. It's also important to understand that the in individual issue of a, of a person bearing arms is raised before the court in a particular setting. Context, yes. and, and by that I mean what the court will look at is a state regulation of your right yeah. and then determine can the state do that or not. So even once you recognize a right, 
you're always considering what the state is doing to limit or expand that right and then decide is that okay constitutionally? Yeah, it's very interesting to me. I went back and read the history of the debate on the 14th Amendment. <clears throat> For many of you who don't know, what generated much of the 14th Amendment was in Reconstruction. Southern states were taking away the right to bear arms by freedmen, recently freed slaves. And much of the discussion in the Congress was to restore that right of the Second Amendment through the 14th Amendment to restore an individual right that was guaranteed under the Constitution. So one of the purposes for the 14th Amendment, the reason, one of the reasons it came about is because those rights were being abridged in the southern states post-Civil War. Let me, let me move on. In the Constitution, we have the right to bear arms. Whether it's incorporated or not, it's stated there. I'm having trouble understanding how we got to a point where a right to privacy, which is not explicitly spelled out, but is spelled out to some degree in the Fourth Amendment, uh, ha which has settled law and is fixed, and something such as the Second Amendment, which is spelled out in the Constitution, is not settled law and settled fixed. I don't want you to answer that specifically. <clears throat> what I would like to hear you say is, how do we get there? How do we get to the point where something that's spelled out in our Constitution and guaranteed to us, but something that isn't spelled out specifically in our Constitution is? Would you give me a, uh, your philosophical answer? I don't want to tie you down on any future decisions, but how do we get there when we can read this book and it says certain things and those aren't guaranteed, but the things that it doesn't say are? One of the frustrations with judges and their decisions by citizens is that, and this was an earlier response um, to Senator Corrin, what we do is different than the conversation that the public has about what it wants the law to do. We don't judges make law. What we do is we get a particular set of facts presented to us, we look at what those facts are, what in the case of different constitutional amendments is, what states are deciding to do or not do, and then look at the Constitution and see what it says and attempt to take its words and its, the principles and the precedents that have described those principles and apply them to the facts before you. In discussing the Second Amendment as it applied to the federal government, Justice Scalia noted that there had been long regulation by many states on a variety of different issues related to possession of guns. Um, and he wasn't suggesting that all regulation was unconstitutional. He was holding in that case that D.C.'s particular re right. regulation was illegal. As you know, um, there are many states that prohibit felons from possessing guns, so does the federal government. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that we make a broad policy choice and say, this is what we want, judge what judges do. What we look at is what other actors in the system are doing what their interest in doing it it is and how that fits to whatever um, situation they think they have to fix, what Congress or state legislature has to fix. All of that is the court's function. So I can't explain it philosophically. I can only explain it by its setting and what, what the function of judging is about. L l thank you. Let me follow up with one other question. <clears throat> As a citizen of this country, uh, do you believe innately in my ability to have self-defense of myself, personal self-defense? Do I have a right to personal self-defense? I'm trying to think if I remember a case where the Supreme Court has addressed that particular question, is there a constitutional right to self-defense? And I can't think of one, could be wrong, 
but I can't think of one. Generally, as I understand, most criminal law statutes are passed by states. And I'm also trying to think if there's any federal law that um, includes a self-defense provision or not. I just can't. What I was attempting to explain is that um, the issue of self-defense is usually defined in criminal statutes by the state's laws. And I would think, although I haven't studied the all of the state's laws, I'm intimately familiar with New York. But do, but do you have an opinion, or can you give me your opinion, of whether or not in this country I personally, as an individual citizen, have a right to self-defense? As I said, I don't I'm, I'm no, I don't your, know if that legal question has been ever presented. I, I wasn't asking about the legal question. I'm asking about your personal opinion. But that is sort of an abstract question well, it, with no, no particular meaning to me outside. Well, I of, think that's what American people want to hear, Your Honor. It, well, is they, want, they want to know, do they have a right to personal self-defense? Do, does I, the Second Amendment mean something under the 14th Amendment? D d does what the Constitution, how they take the Constitution, not how our bright legal minds, but what they think is important, is it okay to defend yourself in your home? If, if you're under attack. It, in other words, the general theory is, do I have that right? And, and, and I understand if you don't want to answer that because it might influence your position that you might have in a case, and that's a fine answer with me. But I, those are the kind of things people would like for us to answer and would like to know. Uh, not how you would rule or what you're going to rule, but, and, and specifically what you think about it, but just yes or no, do we have that right? I know it's difficult to to deal with someone as a like a judge who who's so sort of whose thinking is so cornered by law. I know. Could, it's could hard. I? Could I? Kind of like a doctor. I can't quit using doctor terms. Exactly. Uh, it's, that's exactly right. But let me let me try to address what you're saying in the context that I can. Okay, which is what I have experience with. All right, which is New York criminal law because I was a former prosecutor. And I'm talking in very broad terms, but under New York law, if you're being threatened with eminent uh, death or very serious injury, you can use force to repel that. And that would be legal. The question that would come up and does come up before juries and judges is how eminent is the threat? If the threat was in this room, I'm going to come get you, and you go home and get, or I go home, I don't want to suggest I am, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Please, I'm not, I don't want anybody to misunderstand what I'm trying to say. If I go home, get a gun, come back and shoot you, that may not be legal under New York law because you would have alternative ways You'll have to lots defend. of explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in a lot of trouble then. But I couldn't do that under a definition of self-defense. Okay. And let, so let, let that's me. what I was trying to explain in, in terms of why, in looking at this as a judge, um, I'm thinking about how that question comes up and how the answer can differ so radically given the hypothetical yeah, yeah. facts before you. You know, the, the, or the, not the, the, the problem is, 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 is we think, we doctors think like doctors, hard to get out of the doctor's skin. Judges think like judges, lawyers think like lawyers. And what American people want to see is inside what your gut says. Uh, and part of that's why we're having this here. I want to move to one other area. <clears throat> You've been fairly critical of Justice Scalia uh, uh, criticism of the use of foreign law in making decisions. And I would like for you to cite for me, uh, either in the Constitution or in the oath that you took, outside of treaties, the authority that you can have to utilize foreign law in deciding cases in the courts of law in this country. I have actually agreed with Justice Scalia and Thomas on the point that one has to be very cautious, even in using foreign law with respect to the things American law permits you to. 
um, and that's an entreaty interpretation or in conflicts of law because it's a different system of law. Uh, yeah, but, I, 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 but I accepted that out. I said outside of those, well, in, in other areas that where you will sit in judgment, can you cite for me the authority either given in your oath or the Constitution that allows you to utilize laws outside of this country to make the decisions about laws inside this country? My speech and my record on this issue, because I've never used it to interpret the Constitution or to interpret American statutes, is that there is none. My speech has made that very clear. So there, you, you stand by the same. There is no authority for a Supreme Court justice to utilize foreign law in terms of making decisions based on the Constitution or statutes. Unless the statute requires you or, or directs you to look at foreign law, and some do, by the way, um, the answer is no. Foreign law cannot be used as a holding or a precedent or to bind or to influence the outcome of a legal decision interpreting the Constitution or American law that doesn't um, direct you to that law. Well, well, let me give you one of your quotes. <clears throat> to suggest to anyone that you can outlaw the use of foreign or international law is a sentiment that's based on a fundamental misunderstanding. What you, what you would be asking American judges to do is to close their mind to good ideas. Nothing in the American legal system prevents us from considering those ideas. We don't want judges to have closed minds. Just as much as we don't want judges to consider legislation and foreign law that's developed through bodies, elected bodies outside of this country, to influence what, and uh, either rightly so or wrongly so, against what the elected representatives and constitution of this country says. So would you kindly explain the difference that I perceive in both this statement versus the way you just answered? There is none. If you look at my speech, you'll see that repeatedly I pointed out both that the American legal system was structured not to use foreign law. It repeatedly underscored that foreign law could not be used as a holding as precedent or to interpret the Constitution or the statutes. What I pointed out to in that speech is that there's a public misunderstanding of the word use and what I was talking about. One doesn't use those things in the sense of coming to a legal conclusion in a case. What judges do, and I cited Justice Ginsburg, is educate themselves. They build up a story of knowledge about legal thinking, about um, approaches that one might consider, but that's just thinking. It's an academic discussion when you're talking about thinking about ideas than it is how most people think about the citation of foreign law in a decision. They assume that a if if there's a citation to foreign law, that's driving the conclusion. In my experience, when I've seen other ju judges cite to foreign law, they're not using it to drive the conclusion. They're using just to point something out about uh, a comparison between American law or foreign law. But they're not using it in the sense of compelling a result. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that on certain Eighth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment cases. Um, let me uh, <clears throat> let me go to another area. I have to, just a, a short period of time. <clears throat> do you do you feel it, it's been said that we should worry about what other people think about us in terms of how we interpret our own law? And I'm paraphrasing, uh, not very well, I believe. Is it important that we look good to people outside of this country, or is it more important that we have a jurisprudence that is defined correctly and followed correctly according to our Constitution, and whatever the results may be, it's our result rather than a politically correct result that might please other people in the world? We don't render decisions to 
um, we don't render decisions to please the home crowd or any other crowd. Um, I know that because I've heard speeches by a number of justices that in the past justices have indicated that the Supreme Court hasn't taken many treaty cases and that maybe it should think about doing that because we're not participating in the discussion among countries on treaty provisions that are ambiguous. Um, that may be of a consideration in, in, to some justices. Some have expressed that as a consideration. My point is you don't rule to please any crowd. You rule to get the law right under its terms. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Coburn, um, Senator Whitehouse. 